Why don't you want to go through with a wedding? You say you've been a dog. Who have you been a dog with? Her best friend. In the late 1980s and early 90s, some daytime talk shows tried a different format. It was the birth of trash TV. Our show's a circus. Our show's stupid. Our show's ridiculous. But people enjoy it. It tapped into the audience's desire to voice their outrage. Free, free, free. 20 years and a technological revolution later, public outrage seems to be everywhere. Here's her tweet that ignited international outrage. Her Twitter page immediately filled with hateful comments. The gorilla's death is also sparking social media outrage toward the mom. Walter Palmer, the lion-killing dentist. Remember how mad we were? There he is. Oh, there's that rage. Today, when unsuspecting people can suddenly be cast as public enemy number one. The whole world is coming out saying I'm this horrible, evil person. How do we keep free speech alive on the internet without letting an online mob take over? If you just joined us, this is our first show, and uh, we're putting together people who haven't seen each other for 35 years. The Jerry Springer Show launched in 1991 during a heyday of afternoon talk shows on TV. We were one out of 20 talk shows, and all the shows tried to be like Oprah. A lot of people have problems with in-laws who come and don't know how to go home. Go after middle-aged housewives. And then along came Ricky Lake. And hers was really the first talk show to go after the kids. Young people are much more open about their lifestyles, much wilder. It just struck me as a business model, so we did that. Let me see if I have this right. You're sleeping with your, you're having sex with your grandson? Yes, sir. What was shocking in the 90s is we had never seen this on television before. The Jerry Springer Show was one of many outlets that fed the public's appetite for the crass and salacious. And on his show... My comment is for the gentleman in the black shirt. The audience had their chance to cast judgment. If you're going to ruin your marriage on a one-night stand, wouldn't you at least pick a pretty woman to do it with? On our show, the bad guys always lose. They get booed. They lose the girlfriend. Only the good guys win. Everyone else loses. Our show is the perfect morality play. Judging what is considered shameful behavior has long been a part of our culture. It is now ordered that you shall wear upon your bosom for the rest of your natural life the scarlet letter A. Hester Prince, she had to walk through the town with the scarlet A, but at the end of the day, she got to take it off, right? When you post some something really damaging, reputationally damaging about someone online. It's searchable and seeable. It's almost like it's tattooed on your head and projected throughout the world, and you can't erase it. Some have argued that shame can sometimes be put to good use, but Danielle Citrin says in her book, Hate Crimes in Cyberspace, that a mob mentality can take over, especially online. If you feel like you're in a group and people are acting in a certain way, let's say an extreme manner, you think, hey, everyone else is doing it. It's totally acceptable. When people get caught up in shaming, they'll often say that they did it for fun. This trolling mentality of, I get pleasure because you have displeasure. And the shaming cycle now follows a familiar pattern. Well, it's a lawsuit that's all in the family. Oh, listen to this. The family relative suing a boy over an accident at his birthday party when he turned eight. She says he broke her wrist, caused her pain and mental anguish. She claimed that her little nephew gave her a, quote, forceful hug. She is disgusting and vile. I hope someone breaks her other wrist and maybe her legs as well. She's suing the now 12-year-old boy for $127,000. That's right, $127,000 over a hug. He should have broken her neck. On Twitter, she's been dubbed the worst aunt ever. New York tabloids even crowned her the Antichrist. Since it's illegal to publicly flog her, we can all do our best to shame her to death. Jennifer Connell is a human resources consultant from New York City. She was at her cousin's son's birthday party in 2011 when the boy, then eight, 
who called Connell Auntie, saw her from across the backyard. What happened next became the crux of a lawsuit handled by Aaron Janeschill and Bill Beckert. Sean ran up to her while she wasn't looking at him and leapt into her arms and uh, she turned like that to uh, see and he landed on her and she fell backwards with all his weight on her. Connell broke her wrist, an injury that required three surgeries. She wanted her cousin's homeowner's insurance to pay her medical bills, but they refused. Under our law in Connecticut, there is no provision for bringing a direct action against an insurance company. You just have to sue somebody to trigger, in this case, the homeowner's insurance, the homeowner's coverage. Beckert says that meant naming Connell's cousin's son as the defendant in her $127,000 lawsuit. There's never any claim for Sean's personal assets. There's never any, anything at all that would suggest that. Nor was there any ill will in the family. But when Connell and her attorneys went to trial in October 2015, a reporter cast the insurance lawsuit in a different light, one with a more emotional, visceral appeal about a child on trial for exuberance. All of a sudden, I got a text message from one of my friends that said, lock down all of your social media. So I was staring at my phone thinking, what does that mean? And when the verdict came, the next headline got even more attention. This marshal appeared in the back of the court, and the attorney said, she's here for you. She's here for your protection. Do I need protecting? I've just am not following what is happening here. It just kept growing. Yet another fall for the 54-year-old Connell, who tried to avoid the media as she left the courthouse crestfallen and likely in need of a hug. Aunt Sue's nephew for hugging her. That one little catch line that was meant to get eyeballs so distorted a storyline. But the stage had been set, and Connell was cast in a morality play as the snobby New Yorker. I was trying to illustrate how turning my palm face up is very difficult, and I made the unfortunate comment that I was just at a party holding this, or you know, this little plate with the food on it, and I was only able to hold that plate for two minutes until my wrist became very painful and I had to put that plate down, which became the infamous Upper East Side hors d'oeuvre comment. Connell testified, quote, I was at a party recently. It was difficult to hold my hors d'oeuvre's plate. It was difficult to hold my hors d'oeuvre's plate. It was difficult to hold my hors d'oeuvre plate. Oh, the horror, the sheer horror. It was so picked up by the mainstream media that it became almost like um, absolutely normal to really villainize her. And, and I just also want to mention that he lost his mom last year. Yep, yep. She passed away. The fact that his mother died recently may also have something to do with why she's suing, because he may have some sort of a trust or some sort of a policy. But, but it's my understanding see. that he... Connell reached out to a publicist who advised her to do something to try to get ahead of the story. The condemnation against Jennifer Connell came fast and furious, but was it fair? This was simply a formality with an insurance claim. I felt like everybody was saying stuff that they didn't know. I think um, it's a good lesson for everybody that you think you know a story, but you never know what's really going on behind it. But the damage was done. Connell's name will permanently be linked to the original story. And that's so often what happens in shaming. The narrative is spread far and wide, whether through Twitter and search. It's really hard to disassemble it. There's a Facebook page. Many of my friends have, quote unquote, reported it to Facebook. And Facebook keeps uh, responding back saying, we've reviewed this page and we find that it does not violate our community standards. Months later, Connell has changed the way she looks and is still struggling to put the experience behind her. It was very difficult to find another job. People reached out and then canceled interviews or then said, oh, we've changed our direction or, you know, mm, we've decided not to move forward. I've taken, had to take certain measures in order to reestablish myself. And I have a um, refreshed identity, which we won't go into any further, but... Talk about coerced expression. Right? Harassers coercing you to have to totally change your identity. There are economic costs and social costs and, and psychological costs that victims bear that are really hard to get back. When I first started working on these issues, you know, 
the common response to any time people would talk about their harassment experiences was stop whining. The internet is the wild west, get over yourself. And I think this idea seems so silly now. 10, 11 years later, we now say, this is not the wild west, this is where we all are. That is your phones, your iPads, your computer, it's embedded in everything we do. And so it's not some other place with different norms. It's where we are and in our space with our norms. To drive home the real life impact of what happens online, Just Not Sports made a video with men reading tweets written by other people to female sports reporters face to face. Okay, uh, the men hadn't seen the tweets in advance. So I, I, ha I have to read all of them, right? Because I mean, I don't know. Read them, I guess. Uh, I hope you get raped again. Oh. You need to be hit in the head with a hockey puck and killed. It's really important when we think about shaming and abuse and harassment that we remember that expression that's often designed to silence other expression. Citroen believes that some protections are necessary to make sure harassers aren't using the internet to silence others, but she's cautious. The internet is such a powerful and important tool, and that's why we really have to think very carefully about limiting speech online, because there is this potent upside that we don't want to lose. But the yearning to judge is powerful. It's what's helped keep the Jerry Springer show going for 25 years. And when it comes to limiting speech in order to preserve free speech, Citrin and others say it's up to all of us to make sure we keep this delicate balance in check. It can't just be the law. Law is way too blunt of a tool. I'm hoping that it's a combination of law and private providers and schools and parents and moderators of content so that we come together and we say, this is not the way we want to live.